I Hate Politics is a podcast about a human activity we love to hate. I am Sunil Dasgupta. You might take from this show that everything and everywhere is political. No, that's not the case. There are lots and lots of things about human life that are not political. Neighborhoods, schools, and businesses often live a great part of their lives at a distance from politics. But any and all of them can become political. Any issue, sometimes small and at other times big and encompassing, can become political when people involved disagree with each other. In this episode, I talk to Silver Spring civic activist and urbanist Dan Reed about the politics of his neighborhood association. This summer, he lost a bid to become the president of his civic group. And I also talk with physician and businessman Joe Zamet Lucia, who has written a book called The New Political Capitalism, where he argues that businesses must engage deeply with politics rather than having a merely lobbying relationship with politicians. I Hate Politics is a podcast about our neighborhoods, workplaces, schools and streets, and our local governments as they function in diverse and democratic societies. This means our politics are messy, dirty, sometimes corrupt, with often self-serving politicians. But no matter how much we hate politics, we are never exempt from it, even when we refuse to participate. In fact, the purpose of politics is to keep society moving precisely when we don't agree with each other, like now. Music for this episode comes from local musician Eddie Boxer. The songs in this episode come from his 2019 album, My Choice, and is available on Spotify. You are listening to I Hate Politics. I am Sunil Daskupta. This week, a new Maryland work group is going to investigate the wisdom of electing circuit court judges in a partisan election. What might have made sense when populations were smaller and power more oligarchic is an anachronism now. The system as it stands has the state governor appoint judges to the circuit bench, and then each appointed judge must seek victory in a partisan election. That is, they must be affiliated to a party and run in an election. They must also seek re-election at the end of their terms. In contrast, judges on the district bench are appointed by the governor and don't have to be elected or endorsed by the public in this fashion. Appellate judges in Maryland are appointed as well and are subject to an up-and-down referendum but not a partisan vote. They don't have to belong to a party openly. There are several problems with electing judges, but the most important one is the widespread adherence in the legal community of the idea of sitting judges. That is, voters are urged by those who know the judges best, especially the legal community, including the bar associations, to only elect judge candidates already appointed to the bench and therefore vetted. If they are right, why bother with elections at all? Having them on the ballot unnecessarily expands the ballot and is a headache really for voters to figure out and possibly depresses overall turnout. In the November elections, Howard County will be trying to get rid of their separate probate court which goes by the antiquated name, the Orphan's Court. 
Many other counties still have orphans' courts with elected part-time judges. That is really an inefficient and unnecessary way of organizing probate courts. To get rid of the Howard County Orphans' Court requires a new law and a statewide ballot question, which will assign probate duties to circuit court judges. Do people living outside Howard County care? First, it is a statewide ballot question because judicial powers are determined by state law. But more importantly, all jurisdictions should look carefully at the positions they elect. In Montgomery County, the clerk of the court is elected, as well as the sheriff. Why? Most voters don't know what is involved in doing the job of a clerk of the court or the sheriff and couldn't reasonably evaluate competing candidates except through incumbency. The election process does ensure that whoever becomes the clerk of the court or the sheriff has to get to know community members as part of the election. This advantage is lost, however, when populations grow. This advantage is lost, however, when populations grow as much as it has, and retail politics becomes really hard. In this context, shortening the ballot, taking out many elected positions, especially in the judiciary, should make for better and more effective democracy than this patchwork of elections and districts that leave voters confused rather than enthused. If you want increased voter turnout, one thing you can do is to simplify the ballot and allow voters to focus their attention on the important races. Worth noting that it took the elevation of a Montgomery County legislator, Kathleen Dume, to the circuit bench to revive this issue. If you want to know more about the work group and the sitting judges issue, our friend Lou Peck has a long article in Maryland Matters that is worth checking out. There have been several questions, including here on the podcast, about how school districts have or have not spent COVID relief monies from the federal government. Harvard University public health professor Joseph Allen recently tweeted that as of May, Los Angeles hasn't spent any of the $2.57 billion in American Rescue Plan money it received last year. He was particularly concerned about designing school buildings to be more resilient to living with infectious diseases like COVID, including the better use of ventilation. In Maryland and Montgomery County, school building ventilation has not improved systematically. Many teachers use in-class air filters. If windows can be opened and kept open, that is done. But it is not the case that there has been an acceleration in HVAC replacement. Certainly, capital improvement plans, which pays for school HVAC systems, have not been altered significantly to reflect this. How have Maryland school districts spent the federal COVID relief money? According to the Maryland State Department of Education, the state received $422 million in the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, called CARES. It's also called SR1, or the first tranche. And $789.9 million in the second tranche, and $2.07 billion, with a B, in the third tranche. As of June 2022, from the first tranche, 90% had been spent. About 35% of the second tranche was spent, and 15% of the third tranche had been paid out. School districts have until September 2024 to spend all the money. Based on available data, Montgomery County appears to have spent all of its first tranche money of about $21 million. 64% went to textbooks and education materials, presumably including the Chromebooks that were sent home in the early days of the pandemic. Another 28% was spent on other instructional costs. Unclear what this category holds. But from the second tranche, 77% 
went to salaries and wages, about 22 million. No spending yet from the third tranche in MCPS. School finance expert Jess Gartner has said that the spending pattern is understandable given how money needs to be spent in a public agency. The first tranche money would have to be spent first because it will be the first to run out, then second, and then the third. School districts have to decide what to spend the money on. This is easier said than done because there are processes in place for deciding how to spend public money. Changing the capital improvement plan to refocus on HVAC, for instance, would be a major decision that will anger those whose projects are at the top of the list and will insist on being served first. This raises the question of leadership, which in the context of the Board of Education is really hard to exercise. The elected members of the board have few tools with which to push for change in this regard, and the superintendent has her hands full, often with running schools and little time for thinking about strategic change. You're listening to I Hate Politics. I'm Sunil Dasgupta. I'll be back with civic activist and urbanist Dan Reed. I never thought I'd stand up tall. I never thought I'd climb that wall. I never thought I'd have it all. Everybody talking like I'm so small. Now what you gonna say to me about being somebody? I'll crush this adversity. Dan Reed, welcome to Ahead Politics. Hey, thank you for having me. You were part of a neighborhood association election. Tell me how that election went. What happened? Sure. Um, for the past year, I was vice president of my neighborhood association in Silver Spring, where I live. Um, and I ran for president as part of a slate with some of my friends and neighbors. Uh, and we lost, three of us lost of the five, uh, due to, as it turned out, I think some very strongly held feelings from a small group of residents about who should represent their neighborhood and what values should represent their neighborhood as well. That's how it looked to me. How many people voted in the elections? What was the size of the electorate? Uh, in my neighborhood, there are probably a couple thousand people. Uh, it is a majority minority neighborhood. It's about two thirds, not white. It's about two thirds renters. Um, the neighborhood association itself was about a hundred and some people when I joined. It was a couple of hundred people when I lost my election in part because we worked very hard to expand membership and to diversify the association. Um, but it's still, you know, fairly small uh, turnout of the larger neighborhood where members who participate in the election and still not very representative either. So, I mean, just 200 people voted, 50 people voted, well, how many people? Uh, 270 some people. I, I got more votes than we had members the year before, and I still lost, <laughs> which is a testament to our attempts to make the Neighborhood Association more diverse. Okay. Uh, so you did say there are 2,000 people, two thirds of them renters. So I assume renters are not part of the Neighborhood Association. No, there, there are some neighborhood associations in Montgomery County that only are restricted to homeowners. Ours isn't. Um, in fact, a, a former president was a renter. Um, you don't, you just have to live inside the boundaries. Um, there was at the time uh, membership dues that we collected. And when I was elected vice president unopposed, one of the things that we did the following year was to get rid of them because that was seen, even though it was only $10, as a barrier to participation. So I've heard this often that you know reducing uh, membership fees uh, helps and reduces barriers to entry for those that don't want to come in 
But, you know, it is $10. You're living in Silver Spring. You know, socioeconomically, just sort of $10 should not, it, it should not be a burden for most, I think, uh, people, just given what their income levels are. I, I think that's the perception, right? That is a perception we have about Montgomery County and maybe the perception we have about Silver Spring. I think it was a perception people had about our neighborhood in Silver Spring, right? One one of the things I did when I was involved was I, I tried to show people what the demographics of the neighborhood were, right? People may not have realized it was two-thirds not white. They may not have realized it was two-thirds renters. They may not have realized that the median age was 34 because the membership was so much older. And they may not have realized that the disparities between renters and homeowners was, was so big, right? Like, according to the census, the median homeowner income in the neighborhood was like two and a half times that of renters, which is to say that for many of the people in the neighborhood, $10 probably was a barrier to participating, whether or not, you know, they could have had $10 or not. But for some people, it may be the decision of, do I use this $10 on something else that I need to live? Or is it a matter of, you know what, I might have 10 extra dollars, but this just isn't worth my time. You know, as PTA president, I did something like that, right? I reduced the PTA dues, but I didn't see any perceptible gain in the membership. I think, unfortunately, in some of these situations, the value is even, the value we get from those $10 is even less than $10. I think the value proposition is really the bad one. That That's a valid point. You know, we... On my year, in my year, <laughs> on, on the board, we did a couple of things with the goal of increasing turnout, right? One of them was re- removing membership dues. One of them was having more social events. You know, instead of having the conventional neighborhood association meeting, which was essentially an opportunity for people to come and complain, mm-hmm. um, we held more social events, right? We went out to one of the apartment complexes, set up on the patio with, with hot chocolate and snacks and stuff and invited people to come mm-hmm. and engage a totally different part of the community. Um, we did more outreach to the PTA. We did um, shorter meetings so that even if you wanted to come to a meeting, like I could get in and out of a meeting, hosting it in 45 minutes. Right. So right. we were taking up less of your time and hopefully giving you more value as well. Uh, and those things did seem to have an impact. We, we did see an increase in membership. Um, I think, but when you talk about value though, one of the things I kept running up against and perhaps ultimately, um, was not able to, to address was, People in our association were often very hostile to new residents or people who expressed disagreements in spaces, whether it was the Facebook page or the listserv or meetings themselves, right? Um, A lot of those disagreements came down to things about development in Silver Spring. A lot of them came up to other issues too. We spent a year arguing about uh, a Popeye's opening in in the neighborhood. Um, perhaps I've just given away which neighborhood it is because I mentioned the Popeyes, but uh, it it was an environment where people did not feel comfortable speaking up. And I heard from so many neighbors that they would say something on the listserv and they would get these nasty emails back from people saying like, how dare you? Why would you say this? Blah, 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 blah. And then I started getting them too. And then that started spilling into in-person interactions and that started to escalate. And it became really evident to me, like the lengths to which some people would go to to ensure that the neighborhood association who spoke for the neighborhood what values the neighborhood represented uh was as restricted as possible so you face this kind of opposition while you are vice president of the uh, association and then you put together a slate to run um and what happens? I mean, what is the campaign like? It is, it's interesting, right? Like we, most elections, the neighborhood association are unopposed. I ran unopposed the first time because nobody was, the seat was open. It had been open for a year. Okay. Um, and that was that. People were so upset. Um, this time we had opponents. Um, we had created a slate, the five of us. And the, the, the platform was basically, we want to make this neighborhood look like, neighborhood association look like the neighborhood. We want it to be more inclusive. We want it to be more welcoming. We want it to be more diverse, which theoretically in, in progressive, welcoming, tolerant, so for spring, that is a winning platform, right? We wanted more social events. We wanted um, more and better forms of communication. People get them involved, things in multiple languages, and like um, focusing on issues that were hopefully, that had broad support, like traffic calming on roads where people speed a lot. 
Um, unfortunately, uh, we lost, I lost. Uh, and I learned a little bit after the fact that one neighbor who had been particularly um, hostile and occasionally kind of abusive towards me may have told some of her neighbors that I was stalking her. Mm. Uh, and I don't know, I mean, first of all, I, I have a dog. I walk my dog in the neighborhood. I walk my dog past your house. Um, I don't know how many people took that. I don't know how many people were swayed by that. No, this is, we weren't out here having debates and posting up flyers all over the neighborhood. Like this is a very quiet thing. Um, and so it was disappointing. You know, I, I lost. Uh, Do you think I, you lost because of that rumor? I ran for PTA treasurer one time. And it turned out that the people that were running the, that PTA at that time did not want me. So the rumor that was spread was that they couldn't trust me with my name on the bank and signing checks. And I saw text messages. Somebody showed them to me. I had no way to defeat that because it was within their internal network, that in rumor. I didn't know about it until after it had been expressed. So, you know, this kind of thing is fairly, I would say, you know, common. It's, 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 it's odious, of course. But have you thought about how you can even counter this kind of thing? I, I, I seem I gave up. I, I walked away. I mean, well, let, me, well, let me say, right? These, these are things that people do. This is sociology. This is in-group and out-group behavior, right? Nothing, you know, it is human, right? It's ultimately barely human. I am the only Black person who has been on the board of my neighborhood association in at least 15 years and possibly ever. So, like, there will always be a little spot in the back of my mind that wonders if this was about something much more than, like, they didn't like my opinions on things. I'm wondering whether this kind of you know, sort of rumor mongering, right? Mm -hmm. Whether we can even do anything about it. The thing that I realized is that this the PTA positions or any neighborhood positions are about being networked into the community. And I was suf not sufficiently networked so that they could rumor monger at no without my sanction. Right. So they could do that. And I had no recourse to that. If I was network, then I could have imposed social costs on them by, you know, right. by by telling people that this is wrong or, you know, and then then the neighborhood get, get divided or whatever. Right. But I had no way to impose costs on them because their rumor mongering was within their internal network. Well, it's a, it is a cycle, right? Like if you keep the network closed, then people can't come in. And if people keep people try to come in as you did, as I did, then it's easier to push them out, right? Like it, it becomes a sort of a perpetual motion machine. I don't know that you can stop humans from being human, right? Uh, I do think that you know, Montgomery County gives neighborhood associations a fair amount of deference. And that is the one piece of leverage that we have to make these organizations either work better and be more inclusive or simply not be the vehicle by which county officials make decisions. Now, going back to the slate that you all had uh, constructed, were you the only black person on it? Um, um, I was. It was um, there were, there were five people, two women, two people of color. OK. And. and and, and, and you guys faced a lot of uh, opposition. There was a competing slate then. Mm -hmm. Is that That's the right. case? And was, were, was that slate also diverse or less diverse? Or what did that slate look like? Uh, they were generally people who had lived in the neighborhood a long time and were, if not white, white passing. They were, to your comment earlier, perhaps more networked than I was. I had only lived in since 2019. OK. Um, and so of the 270 votes, then your slate got how many and their slate got how many? I think it was a difference of 30 votes between the oh, two. Yeah. So, you know, it's um, not quite 10 percent margin. Yeah, 10 percent margin is a, is a big margin, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so you lose 
and you know losing is always humiliating as as I, I know very well uh but what lessons did you draw afterward from this experience um it taught me a lot about the incentives or disincentives people have to get more involved in their communities right like my entire career as an urban planner and as an advocate has been about i want people to care more about the things happening in their neighborhood and you know what are the venues that people get to learn more about their communities and who are we inviting into them right you know the neighborhood associations historically have not been a place where everyone is welcome um and i tried to fix that i think we made some progress you know maybe we lost the battle i don't know if we've we've lost the war um the neighborhood is only going to get more diverse the county is only going to get more diverse um there is only going to be more demand for more representation from people who you know i'm not just talking people of color people who are younger people who have kids people who aren't homeowners um to be heard right but the bigger question is and this is like i said the ongoing question of my career is under what circumstances are you going to get people fired up to participate uh if it's a neighborhood list serve where people are going to get abusive messages for speaking up probably not an incentive uh is it a community event where all people have to do is show up and drink some hot chocolate maybe that helps right what are all the different you talk about ladder of engagement all the different touches that people can possibly have to give to something to feel like they're a part of something bigger and like recognizing like they're you know understanding all the different ways people can do that right participating in your neighborhood association is a big lift in your time sometimes your money in the case of me and many other people in this neighborhood mental health um there are probably other and better ways to engage people and i look forward to finding them both as a resident of this neighborhood but in my professional life as well you said a little while ago that the county government has some leverage over the how to change neighborhood associations the assumption there i think is that county government has changed in a way that but the neighborhood associations have not in sort of compare for me if you will you know the expectation that the county will actually do something because in the literature we know universally from top to bottom you know people with more resources people that are better network people that have more money people that control <clears throat> excuse me uh, productive assets in society you know they have an a, a larger say in in political outcomes right so there is i think there's an assumption here that you're making is that in the the county itself has changed but the neighborhood associations have not is that true how how do you see that i think that's true i think it's true you know the neighborhood associations are the the smallest form of community participation in in any place like Montgomery County and i to your point about like the county is changing more and i think you're seeing more diverse representation at the county level cuz like it's just a bigger pool right ironically you might think it'd be harder but you know when your sort of universe of social capital ends a few blocks from your house you know naturally there's a whole big part of your life that's on the other side of that that you can't access right um when and i i think the bigger the bigger that space is right the more you can say like well here are all these other credentials here are all these other people that can give me credibility here are all these other things that i can do that i can be a multifaceted person because it's a bigger space for me to operate in um in the neighborhood you don't always have access to those things dan reed thank you for coming on i hate politics thank you so much have a great week That was Silver Spring urbanist Dan Reed. You're listening to I Hate Politics. I'm Sunil Dasgupta. 
I'll be back with physician and businessman Joe Zamet Lucia, who has written a new book called The New Political Capitalism. Joe Zamet Lucia, welcome to I Hate Politics. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. You argue in your book that business people today don't want anything to do with politics. They want to be left alone. But historically, business and politics have worked together, going back to the railroads or the opening of China or steel mills or now healthcare. You know, they are very, very deeply interrelated. There only seems to be a sliver of time, perhaps between 1980 and 2008, about 20, 30 years, when the neoliberal moment was at its zenith, when really there was this idea that you could, in fact, separate business and politics from each other. And you're right. It was maybe an exception. But the current generation of business leaders have known little else. So, so they've come to expect, or at least some of them have come to expect, um, this kind of leave us alone politics type of perspective. You know, as I say in the book, you know, it's quite often to hear people in business saying, you know, if only politics would just keep out of it, we can get on with the business of doing business. But don't you think that is a fake assumption? The Milton Friedman idea that the only role of business in our society is to maximize shareholder value is a nonsense. But it doesn't mean it wasn't believed. And it doesn't mean that we didn't construct institutions and behaviors around that. There is the politics of influence, which business has always engaged in. You know, they make, they make, uh, uh, they they set up PACs, they make political contributions, they spend m- millions of dollars trying to influence for self-interest. Okay, That has never gone away, and it was always there. But what I mean by politics is something different. So what I mean by politics is the mechanism by which we decide what sort of society we want to live in. Now, business has a huge impact on the sort of society in which we live. And these days, what's expected of business is that they take that responsibility seriously. A big part of your book involves you talking to other business leaders uh, and trying to convince them that politics matters. Um, When you bring it up, what do they say? Well, it, they vary. it varies. You know, there's no such thing as business. There's no sure. such thing as business people. There are different people in different businesses. Some recognize this, but then react by saying, well, this won't actually have an impact until after I've retired. So I can just carry on because it's not going to happen on my watch. Um, others are frightened by it because they feel that this is an environment in which they're not used to operating. Um, it's it's not it's not what they were taught at business school. They were taught something different at business school. It was all about you know getting your module on finance, getting your module on HR, getting your module on this and that. Um, so it's it's not how they were brought up. It's not it's not the image they have of themselves as being a political animal. The image they have of themselves is of pushing up the stock price and making their numbers. So so. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable. It causes anxiety. Then there is the group that says, yeah, we understand all this. The world is changing and we have to change with it. Um, how do we do that? You know, it's not easy. You know, it's, you, what, what can we do to move in that direction? Right. So do you understand what lies under this variability? I mean, are there some industries that are more typical of this? Are people that are trained in business schools different from people trained in engineering schools, for example. No chief executive has been trained how to speak politically. So when they're asked, when they're asked, what's your position on abortion? This is not a question that chief executives know how to answer naturally. Um, It doesn't play to who they are 
and how they've been trained to speak and see the world because they've been trained to speak to Wall Street. How do you train uh, business people to speak politically on you know, hot button issues such as abortion? Of course, as with all training, they have to want to do it. They have to realize that this is a gap. These past few decades, when we've painted chief executives as these somehow supermen who deserve $100 million of compensation, uh, the idea that you have gaps and that you're incompetent, essentially, in one particular aspect does not come very easily. The second is that you have to work at it, just like ev- any other training. But the third, and maybe maybe more important, is that they need to surround themselves with people who have different views of the world and different perspectives. If you look at most boards and most executive teams, most people on those boards come out of the same cookie cutter. You know, they've had the same business career, they've had the same training, they see the world in the same way, even though, you know, some of them may be women and some of them may be ethnic minorities, they're still chosen for the fact that they have this kind of business experience, as it's called, this, this being, being trained in exactly the same way. That has to change. Your argument up until now has been that business folks need to uh, become more trained up in um, political matters to be able to speak to it. What about the other side? What about how political folks deal with business? Have you thought about that? The way of being and the way of thinking, if you're in politics and in business, is fundamentally different. Uh, you know, you're looking at the world through a very different type of lens. Um, and you know, a lot of a lot of action by government and regulatory action makes assumptions about how business will react and how business will respond to these things, which is incorrect, (laughs) Um, which is why a lot of regulation fails. Uh, Because, you know, any regulation generates an industry of how to get around it. Um, And, you know, we can't get away from that. That's always going to be the case. I think it's a collective endeavor that we need to move forward towards, as opposed to this adversarial situation where, you know, any discussion turns into a a battle to the death. But don't you think that there is variability even there, that there are cooperative relations between government and business in certain aspects? And, you know, there are adversarial ones and that there is not one business or one politics. And, you know, there are different parts of it work differently. Uh, This is a, a, you know, local podcast. And, Mm -hmm. you know, if you look at local politics uh, and particularly um, real estate development, you know, Government and business have to perforce work together. Now, they, you know, are constantly complaining about each other. (laughs) That's for sure. That's for sure. And, and, you know, and business is pointing out it's better to be in in Virginia than in Maryland, which where we are, or, you know, or whatever. But, you know, they are building here. They are building there. And they're complaining there. They're complaining here. Right. And, and, you know, you have, and they are required, for example, in, uh, the county that I live in, Montgomery County, in suburban Washington, D.C., in Maryland, that they have to build, for example, uh, a new, if you're building new homes, you have to build 12 percent of homes to be um, affordable. Right. Right. So, that- uh, yeah. So and then you have to um, build some uh, amenities uh, or at least pay for building those amenities, such as sewers and roads and even schools. Right. And so th- there has to be some agreement, some level of cooperation between business and politics that, you know, there's no getting around. No, I agree with that. Um, and the question is, is that a cooperative arrangement or is it people in pulling in opposite directions? So, you know, when when your governor or whoever it is decides to pass legislation that says you have to build X affordable homes or you have to contribute to the sewers or whatever. How does that discussion go? Is it, oh, um, that's terrible because it's going to increase our costs. And if you do that, I'm going to go to Virginia. That's not helpful. 
not many doctors, medical doctors, become involved in politics. I mean, if you think about people being involved in politics, if there's a profession that is associated with that kind of thing, it's lawyers, right? Yes. Um, doctors tend to stay away uh, and stick to the Hippocratic Oath. Um, why do you think doctors don't get more involved? And when they do, I mean, you get Rand Paul, which is... <laughs> <laughs> I, I never thought about that question, so I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you some immediate feedback, which is uh, uh, sort of unthinking, if you like. Um, but I think that politics is about the contestation of ideas. So to to get involved in to, to to want to get involved in politics, or to have the aptitude or the interest to get involved in politics, you need to. Um, see the world as a contestation of ideas. Um, if you're brought up in a scientific uh, education, um, you're brought up to believe that you're looking for truth, you're looking for facts, and it's facts that should drive what you do. Um, as a doctor, you know, one of the things that makes it possible to be a doctor is to kind of have a sense of a self self sense of certainty uh, that allows you to make life and death decisions. Uh, if you keep if you keep worrying about all of those at every moment of the day, you kind of freeze. So maybe, and I don't know if this is the case, that the kind of technical scientific education is doesn't prepare you for the kind of rough and tumble uncertainty, there isn't really any truth of the reality of politics. That's just a theory that I've made up in response to your question, and I have no idea whether it's in any way <laughs> right or wrong. I, I think you have something there. Uh, it's, you know, do you want to see medical education change? I want to see all education change. Um, I think education is largely less so actually in the United States, but certainly in Europe, um, education is largely still stuck in the 18th century, where it's didactic, it's the esteemed professor telling you how it is. The issues that we face are not technical or technocratic issues, they're largely moral, philosophical and ethical issues. So, you know, I'd like to see people who are in, in the STEM subjects who are learning how to code, I'd like to see them have modules of ethics and philosophy and politics. I say this a lot, so I'm going to ask you also. What is harder than brain surgery? Politics. How so? Well, Einstein said famously, politics is much harder than physics. Well, that, that he is correct. Right. But the way uh, that I put, you, you know, you, you, my usual answer to this is, you know, it's harder to pay for brain surgery than it is to do brain surgery. And that's a political question. That is exactly it. Right. <laughs> um, so that's a political choice that is harder to pay for brain surgery than to, to do it. And, and politics is difficult. I think it is the most difficult thing to do because it's about finding a way forward in a world where everybody wants something different. Okay, you've got well, not know, quite everybody, but I get but the larger. You get point. the gist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, so you know, it's it's a very difficult thing to navigate, and you know, it's one of the differences again between how business people tend to see progress and how progress happens in society. So, you know, if biz if a business person wants to progress their organization, they decide I'm in place A, I want to get to place B draw me the straightest line possible and let's get there in the most efficient way that we can. But social progress and politics is not like that. I describe it as being like a sailing boat in rough seas where you have to tack this way and that depending on how the political winds change, where you take on water, where you're pushed back and nearly drowned and where somehow eventually you make some forward progress. On that note, Joe Zamet Lucia, thank you for coming on I Hit Politics. This is to be continued. Thank you so much.
What lessons can we draw from my conversation with physician businessman Joe Zamet Lucia and Silver Spring urbanist Dan Reed? We expect neighborhoods, schools, and businesses, and much else about our lives not to be political. But when we disagree with each other over things we need to do together, those issues escalate and they become political. The intensity of the disagreement determines the intensity of the politics. Not surprisingly, issues about housing and zoning inclusion over which we disagree intensely become politically intense and even neighborhood association elections become political. When civic associations comprise middle class, homeowning, white people and there was considerable agreement among them, neighborhood associations would have been less apparently political. As demographic change ripples through neighborhoods such as Dan Reed's, change in the way civic associations operate, bringing them into sync with growing diversity, could very well mitigate the political aspects of civic associations and they become more social groups. At a very different level of analysis, Joe Zam at Lucia sees a breakdown between business and politics coming out of neoliberal theology of utility and profit maximization that reached its zenith in the West between 1980 and 2008. The neoliberal moment included the denial of the political roots of our economic system and was in many ways the exceptional era. The growing recognition of the interrelated nature of business and politics, of which Zamet Lucia's book is one example, brings us back to history. Most great economic thinkers, whether Keynes or Marx or Adam Smith, wrote about political economy, meaning how politics and businesses were in fact interrelated. To go from there to neoliberal theory is not only a head-scratcher, but really the evolution of economics into a discipline so theoretical that reality had to bend to its shape. To correct this, as Zamit Lucia says, we need a massive re-education effort, not just of politicians and business people, but of society at large. That's all for this episode. You've been listening to I Hate Politics. I am Sunil Dasgupta. Music for this episode comes from local musician Eddie Boxer. The songs for this episode come from his 2019 album, My Choice, and is available on Spotify. If you want to share your music on the show or know someone else who might want to, please email us at ihppod at gmail.com or reach out on Twitter at ihppod. I hope you'll subscribe and share the show as we bring you stories about politics close to you and to your home. See you next time. Cross my heart, hope to die. Nothing that I say to you could ever be a lie. If everybody just knew what I knew, they would all know what's so special about you. Cross my heart, hope to die. Nothing that I tell you could ever be a lie. Feet on the ground, but you rise to the sky.